Have you ever had one of those just amazing coincidences where things all of a sudden just align right together? You just think this is a God moment. This is a God moment. I had one of those last night during Sarah Swafford's talk. Sarah was talking about authentic friendship. She's talking about this group of friends that she used to run around with, this group of friends that would push her farther in her faith. And as she was talking, I was like, no way, Sarah. You didn't didn't know what I was going to talk about today. How, How did you know to talk about that? It's no mere coincidence. I really believe it was providential. Because today I was going to start off my talk talking about when I was a student in college. I've been thinking through all the focus conferences that I've been to. This is my 16th conference. And I thought about which conference changed my life the most. And it was the one when I was a student. When I was in your seats, just like you. And I went to this conference in Denver, Colorado with just the most amazing friends. I want to show you a picture of my friends here. You might notice some of them as we put it up here on the board. In the middle, there's a woman named Sarah Henry, as I knew her then, but now she's, of course, Sarah Swafford. She's who spoke last night. Right next to her is Doc Swaff, her husband. They were engaged at the time and got married shortly after. On the left-hand side is myself in the white shirt. I'm there with my then-girlfriend, Lisa Augustine, who a few months later, we'd get engaged, and now she's Lisa Cotter. On the far right is another amazing two people. The man was my best friend in college, Jared Cheek. He went on to become a seminarian. He actually died tragically in a car accident while he was in seminary here in Chicago. Off to the very far right is Ali Minnelli, a dear friend, an amazing teacher, amazing mother, and she also has the privilege of being Steve Priest's wife. Steve, who was the MC of Seek last year. Just what an amazing privilege to be able to go to a focus conference with these amazing friends that push my faith further and further. But when we'd go to the focus conference, we'd come in and we're like, oh, we're fine. Everything's great, right? And then we'd be on the bus ride home and you'd look around and everyone's life would be changing. Decisions would be made at that conference. And I was trying to figure out why. What is it about a focus conference that does that to us? What is it about being here that all of a sudden our lives begin to change? And I tried to pinpoint it. I thought for five days we actually get to listen to the voice of God. We get rid of all the other distractions. We just listen to Him. And we begin to see the world like He does. And when we do that, our lives begin to change. Today, our theme is build. And we're talking about how to build up your spiritual lives. We're talking about how you can build up others as well. And when I think of build, I think of being like Jesus. That's our ultimate goal in our spiritual life. But that's a really big topic to cover in this one talk. So I want to think through what's one way we can be like Jesus? What's just one thing that we can do? My proposal for you today is this, is that if you see like Jesus, then you can live like Jesus. If you can see like Jesus, you can live like Jesus. We're going to look look at what it means to see like Jesus and how we can learn to live like Jesus as well. We're going to walk through three changes. Three changes that can happen in your life when you begin to see like Jesus. When you begin to see the world like Jesus. I know some of you are sitting there and you're like, "I'm, I'm ready for change. God's already working on my heart. I think this is going to be a great talk for you to continue to explore those questions. Some of you are sitting there in your seats thinking, all right, I I think I need to change a few things in my life. This this conference has been good. This talk is going to allow you to dive in even further. I know there's some other of you out there that you're still not sure why you're at SLS. You're like, I don't even know what SLS stands for, right? This talk is going to allow you to explore what it means to see like Jesus, what it means to to dive further in your faith. Let's look at these three changes. Before we do that, let's go ahead and pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, you've given sight to the blind. 
In the Old Testament, you gave prophets new vision. In the New Testament, you converted Paul, you blinded him, and then scales fell from his eyes. Lord, help us to see like you. Help us to be like you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. This last year, I've been thinking a lot of this question of how do I be like Jesus? And when I think of this question, I was trying to explore, Lord, I don't want to see the world like I do anymore. I want to see the world like you do. And so it seemed pretty natural to start reading the Gospels, pretty natural to start reading about the life of Jesus. And the the first place I really landed, which goes well with our homily this morning, is I landed with the call of the disciples. In Matthew 4, Peter and Andrew are sitting along the shore, and Jesus comes up to him and says, follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. And the Gospel of Matthew says, Peter and Andrew, they just dropped their nets, they left their boats, and they just followed after Jesus. And sometimes when we get to the Gospels, I think as Christians, we don't ask enough questions. We think it's like Jesus' world. Like, oh, in Jesus' world, like Jesus just says things and does things, and there's miracles, and it's no big deal. But Peter and Andrew were real people making real decisions about their jobs and their lives and following some guy into the wilderness to be like him. And so if you can imagine just Peter and Andrew sitting there in their boat and they see Jesus come along and he says, follow me, why would they just leave their nets to follow Jesus? Why would they leave everything behind? And a lot of this has to do with the Jewish culture. In ancient Judaism, their highest value was to learn their scriptures, to learn their story. There were all these other pagan people around them, and if they didn't know their story, if they didn't know their scripture, then they would leave the faith. And so from a very young age, they'd begin to learn scripture. From the ages of six to 10, these kids in this grammar type school would read and write and memorize Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. They wanted that scripture to be on their hearts so they could live out their faith. And for many of them at the age of 10, if they weren't the best in their class, they'd go back home and they'd start learning a trade, a trade like fishing. But if they were great, then they'd go on to the next school, kind of like their high school from 10 to 14, and they would read and they'd write and they'd memorize the rest of the Old Testament. And it's at that point where really the separation from the best of the best would happen. Those who wanted to go further, they'd have to study under a rabbi. And the rabbi would begin to ask them questions. The rabbi would see if they had what it took. Because if you followed a rabbi, you just didn't fall around and and learn from him. When the rabbi took you in, you learned to be like the rabbi. If the rabbi told a story in a certain way, you would learn to tell that story in that same way. If the rabbi ate a certain way, you learn to eat that way. If a rabbi slept a certain way, I think you get the picture. They would learn everything about that rabbi. And a blessing came about. May you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. May you be following him so close, learning what it meant to be a rabbi, that the dust from his sandals would just cover you from head to to toe. That was an actual blessing that they had. So you'd go through this testing period. If you didn't have what it took, you'd go back and learn your family's trade. But if you did have what it took, you would hear the two words that every Jewish boy would want to hear. You'd hear the two words, lek hakarai, come and follow me. And so when Peter and Andrew, they're sitting in their boat, And Jesus comes along, and Jesus is saying, come follow me. Jesus isn't just saying, hey, take some classes. No, what Jesus is saying is that I think you, Peter and Andrew, can be like me. I think you have what it takes to be a rabbi. And the question that we have for ourselves as we explore who Jesus is, as we begin to look at the world like Jesus does, is what are we willing to drop in order to follow him? As we look at being disciples of Christ, what are the things in life 
that we're going to leave behind. This is the first big change as we explore what it means to see the world like Jesus. You begin to see all the things in your life differently. And you see them in light of what it means to follow Jesus. You know, my, my brain works a little bit differently. And so I have this weird connection, but I, I wanted to talk about this book and how it relates here. I don't know if any of you have read this book before. It's The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up by Marie Kondo. Anybody read or heard of this book? Got some hands? This book has sold six million copies about cleaning. It's an amazing book. It was a New York Times bestseller. And I've had about 43 people at some point in time in the last 40 year, four, four years come up to me and say, hey, have you read this book about cleaning? Oh my gosh, you're excited about cleaning. Tell me more. Okay, tell me more about cleaning, please. And from these 43 people I've talked to and the one blog post I read about this book, here, here's, here's kind of the principle behind the whole book. This is what people tell you. When Marie's telling you about this Japanese way of tidying up, she talks about going to a specific place in your house, taking all the items. So imagine like going to your closet, you have shirts and pants. So you take these items and you hold the items up and you ask one question. Does this item bring me joy? Does this item bring me joy? And if the item does bring you joy, in fact, the items that bring you the most joy, then you take it and you put it in a pile to keep. But if the item doesn't bring you joy, then you thank the item for its service <laughs> and you put it into another pile so that somebody can else can use that item. And it's kind of a funny process and it's, it's fine, but I, I kind of like the method. But I want to change the question. I want to change the question. Do, do the things in my life help me follow Jesus? When I hold up the things in my life, all the material possessions I have, all the habits, all the people, and when I hold them up, can I ask the question, does this help me follow Jesus? Because that's what Peter and Andrew did, right? They looked at their nets, they looked at their boat, they looked at their job and their livelihood, and they held them up and said, does this help me follow Jesus? And they said, no, I need, I need to run after him. I need to learn to be a rabbi. And so for us, I think we need to hold up the things in our life. We need to hold up our phones, all the apps, all the social media, and say, does this help me follow Jesus? We need to pick up our computers and think about all the media we watch, all the TV shows, all the music we listen to, and ask ourselves, does this help me follow Jesus? Ladies out there, some of you, you, you need to pick up your boyfriends. <laughs> Feet dangling. And need to ask, do you help me follow Jesus? And if they don't, you need to say thank you for your service and you need to put them aside <laughs> and let somebody else. <laughs> Jesus, don't really pick people up, seriously. But <laughs> Jesus is adamant about this. At one point in the gospel, he says, if you love father or mother or brother and sister more than me, then you're not worthy to follow me. You can't lek hakarai. You can't be my disciple. And I don't often add to the word of God, but I think it's safe to say if you love boyfriend or girlfriend or I don't know what we are more than me, <laughs> then you're not worthy to follow me. What are you willing to leave behind? Do you see the world like Jesus sees the world? Because if you see like Jesus, you can begin to follow him. You begin to live like Jesus. Now at this point in the talk, some of you might be thinking, all right, I, I like this, this change talk. This is pretty good. All right, I'm thinking about some changes. How can I be like Jesus? There might be some other of you who are in your seats thinking, be like Jesus? Like, wasn't Jesus God? Like, isn't this a little bit difficult? Like, Kevin, I, I can't even be like my roommate. And you want me to be like Jesus? I can't, Kevin, I can't, I can't be like my focused Bible study leader. 
or my focus missionary on campus. Like, there's no way. And you want me to be, you want me to be like Jesus? I totally get what you're saying. I, I totally understand. I, too, have an amazing roommate, my wife, Lisa. <laughs> right? And you're like, ah, I'm trying to be like Jesus. This is tough. I, too, had this focus employee at my office every single day. His name is Curtis, <laughs> Curtis Martin. And Jesus, you want me to be like you? We look at all of our faults and our failings. We look at all of our sins and our life and say, I can't be like Jesus. How do I do that? And the answer is ultimately me playing the piano, ironically. And we have a piano over here with the band so I'm gonna head on over. Because sometimes when we try to be like Jesus, it's a little like me trying to play the piano. I'll, I'll try to play the piano for you. This is my best piano playing. That's how good it is. I'm not very good. A lot of times I think when I hear the question, be like Jesus, I feel like God's telling me, I, I, I want you to be the best piano player in the world. Like, I want you to just be awesome. And here I am trying to play the piano. I mean, this is, this is the best I can do, Lord. And he's sitting there, he's like, okay, try again. You're like, I don't, I don't know if I can do that. I know I'm supposed to be like you, but I, this is how... This is how I play. This is how I live. What am I supposed to do? Answers can be found in a short video that we can play right now. In the mid 19th century, the British aristocrat Lord Radstock was staying in a hotel in Norway. One evening, he heard the sound of a piano being played horribly in the hallway downstairs. He looked and saw a little girl who was making the most terrible noise. He was normally a patient man, but slowly the continuous racket began to drive him mad. As he watched, a man approached and sat down beside her. Rather than stop the little girl's efforts, the man began to play, constructing chords alongside her. With each keystroke, his playing complemented her notes, and suddenly a breathtaking sound filled the whole hotel. He took her mistakes and discord and turned it into something utterly beautiful. As Lord Radstock later found out, the man playing alongside the girl was her father, the famous 19th century Russian composer, Alexander Borodin. Often as we look back, we can see Go that God cut. can use our mistakes and good. We can cut video. Great. We so many times feel like that little girl. We act like that little girl with all of our faults, with all of our weaknesses, with all of our sins. But the good news is that when we are in a relationship with Jesus, Jesus comes alongside of us and helps us make something beautiful. I want to go back to Peter. He's kind of our, our guy of the day, I guess, with the homily today and my talk as well. Because when Peter began to follow Jesus and Matthew, everything happens really quickly. But when we read the account in Luke, Luke slows things down a little bit. In Luke, we see this from Peter. When Jesus calls him to follow him, he says, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Peter feels just like you and me. Jesus is calling his disciples. He's saying, follow me. Be like me. I believe in you, Peter. I think you can be a rabbi. I think you can be a great teacher just like me. And Peter says, Lord, I'm a sinner. I can't do this. And yet Jesus still calls Peter to follow him. But Peter was a man of his word. Peter was a sinner, and he demonstrated it over and over and over again to prove himself right to our Lord. In the Gospels, we see Peter claims that Jesus is Christ. But then immediately after, he says, Jesus, you can't go and die in Jerusalem. And Jesus calls him Satan. 
We see Peter is invited in the agony of the garden to pray for one hour with Jesus as he faces his greatest temptation. And Peter falls asleep. We see Peter who says, Lord, I, I won't deny you. I would never deny you. And Peter denies him three times. Can you imagine being Peter? And especially, can you imagine Peter when Jesus resurrects from the dead? Not only have you betrayed your best friend, but now you have to face your Lord and your God and all of your weaknesses and all of your sins. But Jesus asked Peter just one question, and he asked this question three times. When Jesus is in his sin and his weakness and his failings, Jesus turns to Peter and says, do you love me? Do you love me? Peter, do you love me? And I love Peter's response. Peter's response is this, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. You're God, you know that I love you. And Jesus uses two words to call Peter back into discipleship, to restore Peter from this brokenness and his sinfulness. The same two words that started off their journey. Follow me. Peter, in your sins and failings, I think you can still be like me. You can still follow me despite those things because you still love me. You're still in a relationship with me. And Peter goes on to be filled with the Holy Spirit. He preaches the gospel without denying Jesus. He goes to jail. He does amazing miracles and wonders. And at the end of his life, Peter himself, the one who told Jesus that he couldn't be crucified, Peter himself is crucified upside down. We can't let our failings and our sins and our weaknesses hold us back from following after Jesus. If we love him, if we continue to repent, if we keep trying, the Lord is going to do beautiful things with us. He's going to be at that piano playing right alongside of us and taking all of our discord and all of our mess and making something beautiful. That's what Jesus wants to do with us when we follow after him. Our second change that we're talking about is seeing ourselves differently, that we're not just a sinner, but ultimately we become a saint through him with Jesus right alongside of us. We've got to see ourselves. We've got to see like Jesus so that we can live like Jesus. All right, so we're going through these three changes today. We're looking at how do I change all the things in my life? When I hold them up and I say, does this help me follow Jesus? When we look at our own selves and sometimes when we see our sins and weaknesses, we need to imagine ourselves at the piano that God's going to still do something beautiful with our life. And now I want to talk about this third change. This third change that can happen when we see the world like Jesus. And that's we see risks differently. We see risks differently. One of my favorite preachers in all of Catholic history is a man named Blessed John, Car John Henry Newman. And John Henry Newman lived in England at a time where almost everyone was Christian. But few people saw the world like Jesus. They were just going through the motions. It didn't really change their life much. You might feel a little bit like that sometimes at your home parishes or with your friends. The faith is there, but it just feels like we're just going through the motions. So John Henry Newman preached to his congregation, he said this. He said, what have we ventured for Christ? What have we given to him on the belief of his promise? And he goes on, I really fear that most men called Christians, whatever they may profess, would go on almost as they do, neither much better or much worse if they believed Christianity to be a fable. They venture nothing. They risk 
They sacrifice. They abandon nothing on the faith, the, the faith of Christ's word. Do you take risks for Jesus? Because if we see the world like Jesus, if we understand it the way that he does, we'll be willing to risk things on the belief of Christ's word. We'll begin to change our lives and do things that we thought we could never do before. And throughout this talk, we've talked a lot about Peter, a lot of things that he's failed at. But I want to point out one thing that Peter did really well. It's actually a story from Matthew 15 or Matthew 14. The situation goes like this. Jesus and the apostles are ministering to people across the Sea of Galilee. And they finish up and Jesus says, all right, I want you to go Go ahead and go across the Sea of Galilee. I'm going to go up and pray, and we're going to meet back later. We'll, we'll hang out later. I'll, I'll catch up later. So the apostles are like, okay, and they get in the boat, and they start rowing across the sea. And as they're going, there's a storm. There's wind in their face, and it takes them a really long time. And it gets darker and darker, and they're rowing through the night. And the Gospels tell us that in the, the fourth watch, which is about from 3 a.m., to 6 a.m. So imagine being on the water. I kind of imagine it's almost dawn. The sun's not up yet, but it's starting to get a little bit more light. All of a sudden, they see this figure out on the water. And it's Jesus. He's, he's catching up to them. He's joining them again. And the gospels tell us that all the, all the apostles in the boat start freaking out. They're terrified. They're like, it's a ghost. Oh, my gosh. I mean, being there all up all night, it's 5 a.m. All of a sudden, you see this figure walking on the water. You're just scared out of your mind. And Jesus calls out to them and he says, it is I. It's Jesus. And I can imagine this moment, the apostles are still like, that's really scary. I'm freaking out. But Peter stands up. Peter says this. He says, Lord, if it is you, bid me to come to you on the water. Bid me to come on to, to you out on the water. What an amazing statement. And Peter's there in his boat. He decides, he decides to get out and walk on water. Because here's the cool thing. Disciples are supposed to be just like their rabbis. If the rabbi could do something, that meant his disciples could do something. And so when Peter sees Jesus out on the water, and he thinks about the risk of walking out, he's not scared. He thinks if my rabbi can do it, that means I can do it. He looks a lot like this. Uh... We're going to get there. It's going to be fun. It's going to be a surprise. He looks, oh my God. See my excitement? I was really excited about this. Oh my gosh, if my rabbi can walk on water, that means I can walk on water. Peter sees risks entirely differently. Peter sees risks in a whole new way. And Peter gets out of that boat while all the other apostles and disciples are terrified and he begins to walk on water. And when he gets to Jesus, actually, he, he doesn't get all the way to Jesus. He starts, he, he does walk on water, which is amazing, but he begins to fall and Jesus catches him. And Jesus, when he gets there, Peter, Jesus doesn't say, boy, that was really stupid, Peter. Like, why did you try to walk on water? You can't be like me. You idiot. <laughs> no, he says, oh man of little faith, why did you doubt? That's what he tells Peter. You can walk on water. You can be like me. You can take risks. But you have to believe. You have to place your faith in me. You have to see like Jesus so that you can live like Jesus. Do you see like Jesus? Are you willing to take those risks in your relationships, in your future job, in conversations with your family members and friends? Are you willing to see the world like Jesus, to see the eternal perspective and to take that risk to come out onto the water? Now, we've, as we've looked through these three changes, 
these three changes that can happen when we begin to see the world like Jesus. Some of you may be thinking, all right, well, we have this five days to see like Jesus, but what happens when I go home? I mean, what am I supposed to do then? Because when I go home, I begin to see everything like the world. I begin to see everything like my friends. And the answer is really in my pocket. The answer is in my pocket because the answer is prayer. Prayer is a thing that helps us to continually see like Jesus. So often we're looking for a vision in life. We're looking for something more. And so many times we turn to our phones. We hold up our phones, we look through social media, and we think through, who am I supposed to be? Like, what's my identity? And we, we put that in everything that's going on right here. But in prayer, we find our true identity. In prayer, we find that we're sons and daughters of God. And that identity is the most important thing. On social media, we look at all the things that people do with their lives, all the experiences that they're having, and we think, I want to live like that, and we begin to see the world like they do. But in prayer, we realize that Jesus did the most important thing for us on the cross, that he died for us, and our participation with that is more important than anything else. Prayer is the thing that can help us see like Jesus. You know, my favorite mystery of the rosary is the agony in the garden. And as I mentioned before, in the agony of the garden, Jesus is facing really the temptation of the cross. He's in a state of anxiety because he knows he's about to suffer and die for the entire world. He's about to give his life for you and for me. And so he takes his three closest friends he takes Peter, James, and John, and he says, will you pray with me? Will you come and will you see the world like I do? Because you're going to face temptation too, and I want you to be here with me as I face my own temptation. And all three of them fall asleep. They don't see the world like Jesus. They don't have his vision. And so many times, that's our lives as well. We'd rather look at our phones. We'd rather go do something else. We'd rather not pray because we don't want to see the world like Jesus. But tonight, tonight in adoration, we have an opportunity to see like Jesus. We have the opportunity to answer Jesus' call that we would be with him for just one hour so that we could see like him. And as we're there in adoration, as we're in our seats, we're, we're, we're in our boats. And we're thinking to ourselves as we see the Eucharist in front of us. And we're saying, Lord, if it is you, bid me to come out onto the water. Lord, if it is you in the Eucharist, if, if you are God, and if you are who you say you are, help me see all the things in my life all my material possessions, all of my habits, all my relationships, help me to see them with your vision. You might be praying on your knees and saying, Lord, if that is you, and the body, blood, soul, and divinity, if that's truly you, Lord, if that is truly, truly you, help me to see myself in whole new ways. Help me to see that I'm not just a sinner, but I can be someone who can be a saint. And Lord, if it is you, help me to take risks. Help me to have the courage to walk on water and to be like Jesus. Brothers and sisters, if the Lord calls you tonight, if he calls you to be like him, do not be afraid. Step out of your boat, step out onto the water, and be like Jesus. Because if you see like Jesus, then you can be like Jesus. Thank you.